I just passed out uh, a uh, chart of chronology of the apostles and what this entails is essentially the entire acts of the apostles plus tradition and I'm, I'm trying to cover all of the apostles eventually it's not all the way done but it, it gives dates it gives uh, references to scripture um, it gives places it gives persons um, and it gives uh, the event itself and it, it, it's kind of one of those tools that will will be useful as we're as we're especially in the apostolic age to just kind of flip through and oh yeah now that makes sense now it, it fits in in chronology and it and it starts to gel and it starts to um, it starts to uh, make a lot more sense um, on a chronological level uh, that is the beauty of Luke by the way that Luke is the only one who claims chronology that he did things in a chronological manner and so that so that Theophilus would have really a full what he saw as history of the early church and uh, history of uh, or the history of Christ's ministry Now, there's a couple of things that I had mentioned. One was, uh, if you look on, uh, on the first page, and, and about uh, two-thirds of the way down, you see Agabus's prophecy about famine in Acts 11, 27, 30. Well, gosh, look at this. Paul's second Jerusalem trip follows that immediately. And there was, I would understand that, that Agabus's prophecy is something about the future, wouldn't you say? Well, Paul ends up taking arms over to Jerusalem to alleviate the famine. Now, you have to ask the question what happened to the well what happened to it maybe it was still there one of the things that becomes evident is this that, that throughout this time period Jerusalem the church in Jerusalem was looking at that giving in a different light than it was given and that becomes very evident that, that they were actually looking at that as they were entitled to this because they were the mother church. That it was actually a tribute, not alms. It was a tribute to them as being the mother church. I.e., set up just like the temple. All of the flow coming in to Jerusalem. All of those in the diaspora. So the church in Jerusalem was treating the Gentile church at this time as if it was like the Jews in the diaspora. And under their wing. Now, I don't know about you, but I have, uh, but I have indications in in Paul's epistles that that didn't set too well with him. And I think that that ultimately even disturbed Barnabas's and Paul's relationship. That it wasn't just over John Mark that they that they had disagreement. That that there was other things involved. In fact, we'll we'll look at that. We'll look at those other things involved that were involved. <clears throat> All this time that we're talking about, uh, we don't have anything written up to this point. The first part of the New Testament that was written was the book 
or the epistle to the Galatians. That was the first written scripture of our and and if we if you look you will find that it's uh, before the council it is on page 1 somewhere around let's see Oops, it's got to be on page 2. Ah, there it is. Uh, AD 48. And it falls in uh, Acts 14, 26 through 28, and Galatians 1. So Galatians, the epistle to the Galatians, was, was written prior to the Council of Jerusalem. So there were, there were issues taking place. And, and that becomes obvious. We'll, we'll uh, refer to that a little later. Now, another interesting uh, event is look at the next one. The next event is the epistle written by James. <laughs> and I ask the question, do you suppose that the epistle of James was in reply to the epistle to the Galatians. Might as well ask the question. And I'll leave that up to you to decide. I'm not going to make any comments there. Some of you know what, what I would say. <laughs> okay. But, you know, the beauty of James is this. No matter what you say about James, uh, you know, Martin Luther referred to James as the epistle of straw. In Martin Luther's uh, setting, I, I, I can identify with Martin Luther. I can see why he was, he was saying that. Now, but the beauty of, of the epistle is this. Is that if you look at the wording that James uses, it's obvious that that's not exactly what James would have written. But the Holy Spirit writes it for him. And he says, you show me your works, and I will show you my works by my faith, or with my, by my faith. And so he was, he was, he was saying, I can only know you as a Christian by your works. That's all I see. So I see your faith by your works. But not before God. He didn't say, I will show God my faith by my works. Because James knew better than that. I hope he did. But the beauty, the other beauty of it is this, is that all the apostles needed some help. They needed some help. They couldn't write what was produced. They could not have written this. James could not have written that epistle. Nor Peter his. Nor even Paul even though he was probably the doctor of doctors. He was uh, by far the most educated of, of all the church leaders. And, and even to this day, theologically, we have yet to have somebody licking his boots. <clears throat> so, the question still remains, what, how much effect is Judaism going to have in, on the Gentile church? I find it interesting that Peter has to be brought along. And you see that. Why don't, do you suppose that every time the manifestation of the Holy Spirit shows up. Peter has to be there. 
If you look at every account in, in the book of Acts, you will see one person that is there every time. And in fact, you will even see that it doesn't occur until Peter is summoned and, it, and he goes there. So that that was also a sign to Peter. Because Peter was going to be instrumental in the Gentile church. He himself called himself the apostle to the Gentiles. I'm sure that, P, that Paul might have had something to say about that. But he himself called himself the apostle to the Gentiles. Guess who the first bishop of Antioch was? Peter was the first bishop of Antioch. You find him uh, showing up from 34 to 40. For six years, he was bishop of Antioch. Now let's look into what is going to take place because up until now the problems that were in the church were seemed to be manageable they seemed to be manageable by changing the organization they seemed to be manageable by by moving out They weren't insurmountable. But this is going to be a great change when the Gentile church exceeds the population of the Jewish church. And that happens very quick. That happens very quick. The first issue that arises and is written other than other than what we've already seen as far as temple maintenance and maintenance of of commune and and maintenance of of the lord's table and 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 fellowship and prayer and and preaching and the word the first major issue comes up about the law What part of the law will be required by the Gentiles? Now, Paul, the issue starts actually not, actually it started before this because remember his, he had some problems with Judaizers prior to this. And essentially, these Judaizers, and I want you to be aware of this, that these Judaizers were not Jewish Jews. They were Jewish Christians. And they were following Paul around and making an impact everywhere he went in contradiction. And they were trying to get all of the Gentiles who were just saved by grace to be circumcised according to the law of Moses. And, and that was not the major issue. It was just a point of contention. It was a point where the Judaizers could say, now you've got to follow all the Mosaic law. It wasn't just circumcision. It was everything else, too. So, Paul writes, uh, in Galatians 1, uh, I am amazed, verse 6, I am amazed that you were so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. This is a very, very powerful statement, by the way. And what Paul is saying there is he's saying, essentially, you can glean from this that what you do to the gospel, you also do to Christ. You see, he says, I am amazed 
that you are so quickly deserting Him, not the Gospel, Him who called you by the grace of Christ for what? A different Gospel. Very straightforward. What you do to the Gospel, you do to Christ. What you do to the Logos, you do to Christ. And the flesh, or the Word was God. And the Word was with God. And we beheld the only begotten of God. <clears throat> Which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if, though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached, let him be accursed. Later he says, and these guys, let them emasculate themselves. Let them cut it off. And it, it, it is such, such an issue at this point, Paul is making it an, 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 it an issue to the church in Galatia. He, he continues and he says, Now, tell me something. If you received justification or you received salvation by faith, are you now perfecting it in the flesh? What's the issue? The issue is this. Justification. By faith. The church in Jerusalem believed the same thing. There was no issue there. Sanctification. By what? Faith again. By grace. By grace. In Jerusalem, sanctification by faith. No, works of law. So that the soul was to be cleansed by works of law. And Paul said, that's a different gospel. So, what we refer to as gospel is this portion, and we don't go on. We, we always refer to gospel as, as the message that saved us, the justification. But, there, but Paul said, wait a minute, there's more to that gospel, and that gospel is about our sanctification, about the cleansing of our souls. And that is also through faith. By grace. And it is a work of grace and it's nothing else. It is not a work of law. And that becomes the issue that the church is facing. Now, the turmoil mounts so much so that, that Paul says this. He talks about a confrontation with Peter, who was whom at the time? A uh, bishop. He was right here. He was the bishop of Antioch. And he says, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, 
he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, doing what? Fearing the party of the circumcision. Now, the way this reads is that it is very clear that James sent somebody to get Peter back in line. Because Peter was actually with the Gentiles, and he was actually eating with the Gentiles. And James sends somebody to, you can ask the question, either warn Peter or tell him not to do that anymore. And the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? See, his point being this, is that these are two distinct churches. And he will grant Jerusalem to be Jewish. But he will not allow the church in Jerusalem to impose upon the Gentile church in Antioch their Jewishness. Their Gentiles. Their Gentiles. To the, to the Gentiles, I became a Gentile. It wasn't the other way. To the Gentiles, I became a Jew so they might become Jews. That's exactly what Paul says is the hypocrisy of, of Peter. <clears throat> we are Jews by nature, but not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law since by works of the law no flesh shall be justified but if while seeking to be justified in Christ we ourselves have been found sinners by the way this word for justified is not the word in Romans that said that that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned or justified to him as righteousness. It is a word that can be also understood as, as being cleansed or being perfected or being, being um, worked over, so to speak. <clears throat> For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For though the law, for through the law I died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered him up, himself up for me. And he says... I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Pretty strong and powerful words. I'll tell you something, it impressed Peter. Because right afterwards, and if you look on your little chronology chart, you'll see that the next event is the council at Jerusalem, and which we find in Acts 15. <clears throat> By the way, it, it, it talks earlier in, in Galatians 1 how um, some certain individuals came in to spy out and steal their liberty. And, and that is very much a part of that. In other words, what was happening from Jerusalem these were coming over to steal the liberty that was in the church in Antioch.
starting in uh, chapter 15 of Acts, and some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others. Now, it's interesting here, guess who some of the certain others are? Peter. And yet he was bishop. <laughs> Pretty interesting. Well, you can tell who Luke's siding with, don't, can't you? Because he is a Gentile and he doesn't want to be imposed the Mosaic law. <clears throat> Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Jews. Now, okay, as they get to uh, as they get to uh, Jerusalem, uh, it says, "But certain ones of the sect of the Pharisees, who had believed, stood up, saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to ob- observe." the law of Moses. You see, here it is. It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe or do or practice the law of Moses. Now, I find it interesting that the, that the term that we uh, use to translate into English that is in the rest of Scripture to do or to obey is actually a word meaning to keep or to guard. So that the law in the Old Testament, what we're to do is we're to guard it. We're to keep it. We're to guard it. We can't do it, but we're to guard it in our heart. Why? Because it is the thing that the Holy Spirit uses to get rid of the sin that indwells us. Now, <clears throat> and the apostles and elders came together to look into this matter, verse 6. And after there had been much debate, and I'll tell you something, this was heated stuff. This was big time debate. Peter stood up and said, Now, notice who speaks. Peter, and I love what he says. Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you. That by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he also did to us. Now, his reference is what? His reference is he saw them receive the Holy Spirit in Samaria because Philip had gone there, remember? And then, then things seemed to happen and so they bring Peter in and they receive the Holy Spirit. Then, the same thing happens with the household of Cornelius, a Gentile. And remember the vision that God gave to to. Uh, to Peter about the kill and eat. Oh, those are nasty things, Lord. Those are ugly things. I don't. You know, I my mouth has never touched anything like that. And and God replies. He says, "What I have considered clean, no longer consider unclean." You see, to the Jews, the Gentiles were unclean, and they weren't to be. You were not to talk or communicate or have any contact with a Gentile. <clears throat> so Peter continues and, and I'll tell you he learned his lesson with that debate with Paul. Now, verse oh let's see. Uh, and he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test? By placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. 
Peter learned a great lesson. And he attached no, nothing. He attached nothing to this. He says, let's not put anything on them. Let's not give them anything. There's no requirements. We will not put a requirement on them. Boy, it sounds like he really listened, didn't he? Now, next James stands up. And remember, the last to talk in Jerusalem is the one in power. Who has the final word in Jerusalem? The high priest. The Sanhedrin can talk all they want, but the high priest will make the decision. And here comes James. And after they had stopped speaking, James answered and said, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. Just as it is written, after these things I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. But! But! Oh, what's the but? James is just going to add something to that. But that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. Now, that's something new. That's something fresh. And you know, Paul covered that in Romans, didn't he? He says, what's an idol? He said, what's an idol? It's nothing. So for the sake of my stomach, I'm going to eat meat. Sacrifice to an idol. Doesn't matter to me. He says, but for the sake of my weaker brethren, I won't touch meat. I won't touch any meat for my weaker brethren. You see, and that's Paul's way of saying, I disagree with you, but I love you. And I'm not going to destroy you with my liberty. But James says, we, but we ask this, that you abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. And it says, this is the reason. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. You see, there's the rest of the story. Now they must do the Mosaic law. Mm -hmm. And I believe James is wrong here. And he wrote it. And he sent it to the churches. Now, Paul responds a little, a little later and he says, you know, I, I agree. They, they asked us to remember the poor. But he doesn't say anything else. Of which we also want to remember the poor. So there's a disagreement there, isn't there? There is a disagreement. And the council of Jerusalem, who is controlled, which is controlled by the bishop of Jerusalem, is in the hands of James. Now we later find out that by the end of James's life, by the end of James's life, um, there's hardly anybody of the church in Jerusalem 
but James is there and, and you read in Josephus and you, and you have this incredible understanding um, he calls him James the Just and remember uh, Josephus would write of course he wrote in Greek and he used Dikaiosune Dikaiosune and he says this James is what? according to the Jews <clears throat> the Dikaiosune would be the fulfillment of divine justice <laughs> that's an interesting term to use toward a man isn't it very interesting indeed now at Josephus continues on. He, he really comes to the conclusion this. Because of the death of James, that God would not forestall the destruction of Jerusalem. What happened in James' death was this. That he was on the pinnacle of the, of the temple addressing the people. And, and the two people next to him threw him off the pinnacle. And he was addressing all of Jerusalem. Now I believe what James was doing was he was biding for the high priesthood. That he had enough power and he was so well respected in Jerusalem. And rightly so. Rightly so. He was a Jew. He was a very much a Jew. He was a practicing Jew but that he was too mighty in political power and those who were also biding for the high priesthood chucked him off. The whole reason why Titus went in and destroyed the temple and destroyed Jerusalem was because the high priests, the, the classes of high priests, each one claiming to be high priest had its own army and they were fighting together. And they had ab literally destroyed the population of Jerusalem. And that it was a hulk of a city. And there were, there were three groups remaining and they were all fighting one against the other. Now, when, when Titus would take in his armies to try to squelch the fighting, they would all get together and fight against the Romans. And then the Romans would have to withdraw and they would start fighting amongst each other again. And it was a complete unalterable event. And the atrocities that the Jews, that, that Josephus, and remember Josephus was a, a priest himself, a Jewish priest who was a general and who had expelled the, the, uh, the Roman legions and had been defeated by Vespasian. And Vespasian took a liking to this general and adopted him as son. And so Josephus becomes the son of Caesar. And he's a Jew. But he's still a Jew. And he was trying to negotiate and could not negotiate. He could not get these factions from, from warring. And so the factions continued to war and they were destroying Jerusalem themselves. And Titus steps in and eventually destroys all of Jerusalem and the temple. And Josephus writes, he said, there was no choice. Titus wasn't given the choice to save the temple. Now the proof of it is this. That Jews remained in Jerusalem until 115. 
It was not Vespasian who, elite, who uh, moved all the Jews out of Jerusalem. But the Jews were rebelling so much that by 115, the emperor of Rome says, Enough. We know why the Jews are rebelling so much. They're close to Jerusalem. So we will draw a 115 mile circle around Jerusalem and there will be not a Jew within 115 miles of Jerusalem. And this happened one, about 115, 112, right in there. <clears throat> if you want some brave heart, blood and guts reading, read Josephus, The Wars of the Jews. And you'll, you'll get a, a flavor for what John reference to the apocalypse. And the blood being up to the bridles of the horses. Josephus describes events uh, just in one of the cities that he was... Uh, defending, and and there was uh, Vespasian had besieged the the city, and he said that there were so many Jews killed that the blood rushed down through the streets like a river, and he has other graphic things to say about it. That one would well say, aren't we in the apocalypse? Aren't we in, the, aren't we in that uh, Armageddon? <laughs> Believe me, the people in Jotapata uh, in 68, and that, by the way, that was the year that uh, James lost his life, I believe he's lost his life 68, between 66 and 68. That, that, the, that those who were in Jotapata would, could not have told the difference. They would not have been able to tell you the difference between that and Armageddon. Now, it is not that John is describing past history. Not at all. And I won't go there. But, at the same time, Jesus had described that. And he said, you who are in Jerusalem, when you see this happening, you take to the hill. And you don't go back for your coat. You don't go back for your cloak. You get out of there. And I believe his message was to the church. Fortunately for the church, there was hardly anybody left at the time that that occurred. And the last person, so to speak, to turn out the lights, his lights were turned out. And that was James. We have that same question in the church today. Essentially, all I have to do to bring that up to date Now where's my... Ah, no oh, thank you.
And you have the same thing. So then all I have to do is, uh, is substitute Geneva or Wittenberg for, for Antioch and Rome for Jerusalem. And, I, and the same questions are there. And, and when, we, when we pass through, <laughs> we're not talking about Seder here, when we pass through to, uh, to the Reformation church history, you'll, you'll definitely see that taking place. Uh, and all the little offshoots that happen in, in response to the counter-reformation, which comes into the Reformation church. And, and, and we put... Um, and 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 I'll, I'll be very general here, but we'll label this I, I think I just misspelled Arminianism and Calvinism. <clears throat> And that's, that's simplistic. That's obviously simpl- simplistic, but I'll, I'll go there because I can support that. Um, and we will uh, next quarter. <laughs> so that becomes the first theological issue in the church. It starts this process, which we will refer to later, as the church council. I guess council. Council with an I. E. Look at something positive now. <laughs> okay. One of the bright spots of the apostolic church is the, is the writing of the scripture itself. And I find it interesting that that didn't happen until 20 years after the ascension. For instance, with the Gospel, uh, Matthew. Matthew writes to Jerusalem between 50 and 55 CE. Mark writes to Rome, and I, and I state here via Carthage, AD 65. Luke and Acts to Achaia in Greece, A.D. 61. Gospel of John to Ephesus, somewhere around A.D. 100, A.D. 98, right in there. So the Gospels take their time in, in production. A lot of people, a lot of scholars will say, well, that might be a problem because how can they remember this stuff? But they're, they're, within the gospel itself, it talks of that. It says that these will be brought to your mind. That these things would be, would, would come, your mind would be inspired to recall these things. But there's a reason also for those delays. The immediate church 
and especially up and to the point of the destruction of Jerusalem. The immediate church thought that the Lord would return in their generation. So why do we have to write it? If he's going to return, and then we don't have to worry about it anymore. <clears throat> also, as long as the apostles lived, they were living eyewitnesses. They were the living word. They were the living epistles. They were the gospels. Could, could you imagine sitting in a church and listening to Peter talk about the life of Christ. Or Mark. Or Matthew. Or Andrew. So as long as the apostles lived, the churches had this notion, well, we have the living guys right here. The eyewitnesses. And they're, they're giving us these accounts. They're speaking to us about these accounts. Now, by the way, you just don't write a gospel in a day, or an hour, or a week. That's not done right away. So, I know that probably a lot of the, those who were called to write and felt that calling were compiling all this time. Making for themselves notes. <clears throat> the Jewish culture, and remember that all of the apostles were what? Jews. They were Jews. So the Jewish culture was very, um, should I say, accustomed to the oral account, to the oral transmission. And they did it very well. In fact, in fact, it's, it's my theory that all of the Old Testament was meant to sing. You were meant to sing all of the Old Testament so that you'd remember it. That was the way that God wrote it in your heart or in your, in your mind. <clears throat> so the Jews were very accustomed to that. And as Peter would go out to the synagogues or as, as even Paul, he would speak to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. So how would he, how would he speak? He might start in Aramaic. He might not. But he might start in Aramaic and end in, in Greek. <clears throat> they also had a complete Old Testament, didn't they? Now, with the Jewish church, they had the Hebrew text. To the Gentile church, it had the Septuagint or the Greek text. And they saw, the church saw the Old Testament as the fulfillment of the church or the fulfillment of what Christ did or, excuse me, what told them of how it would be fulfilled. Now, from a Jewish perspective, that becomes a problem because the only remaining hermeneutic at the time of, I'd say, after 70, 
and certainly within a hundred years after the ascension of Christ. But after 70, the only remaining Jewish hermeneutic is that of the rabbinic Phariseeism, rabbinic Judaism that we see today. And it had this incredible degree of, of literal understanding. So the Gentile church said, well, wait a minute, there's much more. There is much more uh, to the Old Testament. Because after all, Christ said, don't think that I have come to, to delete or destroy the law or put away the law. I have come to fulfill it. And then he defined the law. He defined the law properly for the Jews. He said, you have heard it said. This is the way they interpreted their hermeneutic was, you have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look upon that woman to, to lust after her, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. In other words, there was a, also a soulful understanding of Scripture. And it was in regard to the law. Now, the spiritual understanding of Scripture is that I have come to fulfill the law. In other words, that the entire law was fulfilled in and through Jesus Christ. So the church, the Gentile church, is going to go toward a spiritual hermeneutic. Toward a, and in many senses it starts to become allegorical in nature. Now, I don't want to say that. I, I don't want to call it allegorical. I know that Origen and others have been accused of being allegorous. But I don't believe that they're that... So much allegorists as they are um, as they are typologists. In other words, that Christ fulfilled the law in type. He was the law was the type of Christ. That all of the law was fulfilled in His act of righteousness. And so that is the ultimate hermeneutic of the Old Testament. Now that changes. So the hermeneutic or the interpretation differentiates between the Jewish and the Gentile church. And you see that today. When, when you, if you were to walk into a, a, a Messianic Jewish temple, you would see a different hermeneutic going on. And it would be toward this literal understanding of law and this issue. Justification. Oh, they they believe in justification by faith, but they all, they believe in sanctification by works of law. Even today. Now, one of the problems, though, is this: is that they don't have the temple, so they can't fulfill the temple law. And they haven't. I'm not sure that they have made that step to see that Christ fulfilled that law. That He was a type, or that, he, that that was a type of Christ. And that that was designed, the law was designed to point to Christ. And point us the way of salvation through faith. Paul 
answers that in the epistle to Galatians, doesn't he? Galatians 4. Actually, Galatians 3, uh, verse 19. Why the law then? (laughs) Why the law? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. Now, the the mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if the law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up all men under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And he goes on. He says, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law. Being shut up, 